Good evening. My name is uh, Christopher Luna, and uh, I'm serving the community this year as a guest scholar, and I'm studying um, religion and society, uh, and I'm also putting on this series of events. Um, so about, on behalf of the Office of Spiritual Life here at Hampshire College, I'd like to welcome you all to this. It's the first event in our series on encountering religion, where we explore the many ways that people confront religion in their lives and in their communities, so we can better understand what religion is and how it shapes our society. So I'd like to start by thanking the Hampshire College School of Critical Social Inquiry and the School of Humanities, Arts, and Cultural Studies uh, for helping to sponsor this series. And I'd also like to thank the members of uh, Mount Holyoke Freethinkers, Atheists, and Questioners who have uh, helped to sponsor this talk tonight. Um, we're very proud to have Chris Stedman with us tonight, but before I introduce him to you, I'd like to give you a little more information about the event series and what we hope to accomplish through these lectures and discussions. So, what is religion? This is really the underlying question that we hope to open up for discussion to the community with these events. And it's a question which is both perilously broad and publicly contentious. Religion occupies a strange place in the American cultural landscape. It's both a powerful force in American cu culture, and it's a strange combination of both the intensely public and the often problematic ways that it plays a role in our politics, and the most profoundly intimate, where we are drawn to it as a source of strength or meaning, or are maybe even repulsed by the way that it has touched our lives and communities. So the dualistic quality of religion's role in society, intensely public and simultaneously intensely private, means that few of us are ambivalent or wholly disinterested in the, uh, in the topic. Indeed, most of us have our own sort of working theory of religion, an idea of what religion is, why it exists, how it acts in the world. And our instinct is to invest our opinion on the matter with a great deal of authority, brought from and sanctified by our constitutionally protected freedom to hold and act on these convictions. So whether we think of religion as a generally positive force in the world, or we identify true religion with a particular tradition, or even if we think of religion as a great social evil, our First Amendment rights offer us a strong place from which to stand and speak. So we look at the way that religion has touched us, and often we think that this is a safe place from which to generalize, and especially in light of the politicization of religion, a necessary one. So in formulating this event series, we have taken the necessity of conversation around these positions for granted. Religion plays such a strong role in people's lives, and in their political, ethical, and communal lives, that it is crucial for us to engage with it and to do so in an environment that's hospitable, both to critique and the respectful exchange of ideas. The communal aspect of this conversation we see is crucial, especially because of how private and intimate our encounters with, uh, with religion, sorry, how private and intimate our encounters with religion can be. Our convictions about religion can seem so strong and sure because of how deeply a religious community has touched us for better or for worse. But as we bear witness to others' encounters with religion, we are often surprised by the diversity both of the religious communities, even within a single tradition, and of people's responses to those communities. The complexity and difference of these encounters, we think, is the perfect opportunity for us to pause and take stock of this thing we think we know so well and so closely, to take stock of what religion is, and to begin a deeper conversation about how it affects us. It is fitting then to begin uh, this lecture, our ser event series with this lecture by Chris Stedman, um, Encountering Religion as an Atheist. Because in many ways, Chris's work is about this encounter, both personally and communally. Although Chris identifies as an atheist, he has worked with interfaith community organizations for many years, and has, explored, and has exhorted his fellow secularists to do so as well. Not because he thinks of atheism as a faith, and not because he thinks that religion should be above critique, but because Chris has a strong, clear commitment to understanding what religion is and how it works in our world. Author of the forthcoming book, Faithiest, How an Atheist Found Common Ground with the Religious, Chris received a Master's of Arts in Religion from the uh, Meadville Lombard Theological School at the University of Chicago, for which he was awarded the Billings Prize for Most Out Outstanding Scholastic Achievement. A graduate of Oxford College with a cum laude, Bachelor's of Arts in Religion, Chris writes for Huffington Post Gay Voices, Huffington Post Religion, 
The Washington Post on Faith, Religion Dispatches, Relevant, and more. He's also the Emeritus Managing Director of State of Formation at the Journal of Interreligious Dialogue, and founder of the first blog dedicated to exploring atheist interfaith engagement, nonprofit status, profit spelled as the prophet Isaiah or what have you. Um, his intellectual engagement with the study of religion is impressive in its own right, uh, but Chris is particularly remarkable for the ease with which he translates this intellectual position into positive social action. Um, in one of his most noteworthy contributions in this regard, Chris served on the initial leadership team of the Common Ground Campaign, a coalition of young people who stood up in response to the wave of anti-Muslim rhetoric and violence in the US surrounding the Park, one con Park 51 controversy. And he continues to advise it in its current form, Groundswell. He also sits on the board of directors of the Interfaith Global Development Organization, World Faith, and is an advisor to the Foundation Beyond Beliefs Challenge the Gap Charitable Initiative. Through his current work as the Assistant Humanist Chaplain at Harvard University, Chris con has continued his ethically-minded engagement with community. In the Values and Actions campaign, Chris has helped guide members of the Harvard Humanist community to articulate the positive values that they associate with humanism, and then to convert those values into acts of service. Chris has organized the, Har the Harvard Humanists in interfaith campaigns to cl clean up local parks, provide good meals to underprivileged families in the greater Boston area, and to write letters to local legislators on issues of social justice and poverty. And these represent only the first year of Chris's work in this role. We're honored to have him speak with us today, and I'd like you to please join me in welcoming him. Um, well, thank you for that introduction. That was very nice. Um, and I think part of why it sounded so nice is you are dressed very formally this evening, and I'm feeling a little inadequate now. I, uh, I walked onto this campus, and I was like, a, you know, before I got here, I was like, okay, I should, I'm obviously going to remove my cap, and, you know, I'll sort of tuck in my shirt and all that stuff, and then I, I walked on campus for a couple minutes, and I was like, eh, I think I'm okay. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you all so much for welcoming me here. Uh, a special thank you to the organizers of this event um, and to the sponsors of this event. Um, it is technically, I guess, the first um, stop on my speaking tour for Faithiest, so that is exciting. But it also means you're going to get a very rusty version of my speech. So thank you for being willing to hear out my rusty version. Um, so you might have guessed based on that introduction and you know, perhaps the title of this lecture or any number of other indicators, but I want to just go ahead and say something, just to be really clear, so there are no questions, and so we're all on the same page. All right, is everybody ready? Okay. I, Chris Stedman, am an atheist. Okay, I'm gonna let that sink in. <laughs> Are we all okay? Everyone cool? Yes? Okay, good. I knew you guys were gonna be cool, but I just had to be sure. Uh, so I am an atheist. Um, and as uh, Christopher Luna pointed out, I have also been very actively involved in interfaith initiatives and interfaith programs for the last few years. And for some people, those that combination of um, the pieces of my work might be a little bit confusing. Um, probably not for you guys. You all seem very smart with it, but um, you know there are. It, I, I, it is a very understandably um, sort of confusing combination of things. <laughs> so I think in order to help explain a little bit why I, as an atheist, think that interfaith organizing is so valuable, I want to start by just sharing a little bit of my personal history a little bit of my background and how I ended up caring so much about these sort of two aspects of my identity and my work. So I actually grew up in a non-religious household. Um, really, we were more irreligious than anything. Um, you know, I never heard the word God growing up as a child, but I didn't hear the word atheist either. It just really wasn't a part of my life in any significant way. I was baptized as a kid, but it was really just a reason to get the family together and my sister ran up during the middle of the baptism and lifted up the 
minister's robe, and I, that may be part of why we never went back. <laughs> um, and, you know, for much of my life, um, for the first chunk of my life, religion just really wasn't a part of it. I became really good friends with someone in third grade who was Jewish, and I was very interested in that, um, mostly because it was different, and I was curious about why, you know, she um, was so involved in this community of people, um, and why she had these sort of stories, these cultural stories about who she was. But it was more a curiosity than anything else. But my um, sort of distance from religion changed really dramatically when I was around 11 years old. I became a born again Christian. And there were kind of two major things that preceded my conversion into uh, evangelical, non-denominational, um, pretty conservative Christianity. Uh, the first was that about a year prior to my conversion, I started reading books like Roots, Hiroshima, The Diary of Anne Frank, uh, books that really not only sort of informed me of some of the great you know, injustices that have occurred within human history, but you know, these were books that really personified that experience, that, you know, it, that told the story of um, the suffering of people who experienced these things. And as a 10-year-old, I was you know, just um, really unable to reconcile that reality. Um, I didn't know how to make sense of the fact that I lived in a world where such great injustices would occur, um, and the fact that I lived in a country where you know, many of these injustices happened not even all that long ago. So that was sort of one piece. And then the other piece was that when I was 11 years old, a year later, my uh, parents separated. My father became um, a bit of a distant figure in my life. My mother had previously been a homemaker, and she entered the workforce and started working multiple jobs. So my family dynamic changed really quickly. Um, and you know, I was 11 years old. You're sort of starting to come into your um, adolescence, and you have all these confusing questions coming up. And so I was looking for a community that could, you know, sort of hold me and provide, you know, support and resources. And also, I was looking for a way to make sense of some of these big questions of meaning and and justice. So when some friends invited me to go to a um, non-denominational Christian youth group. It seemed, for the moment, like it was the perfect fit. You know, it, it provided a framework for understanding um, sort of injustice. You know, it, it it said that you know those who um, who suffered would be redeemed, and those who you know perpetuated suffering would uh, get theirs in the end. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it also create it also provided a space for me to feel very included and um, cared for. I mean, I remember. A week after I converted, less than a week, I got a phone call from the youth minister asking how my math test had gone. And I mentioned it really sort of casually, and he was like, oh, how'd that math test go? And it you know, made me feel like they were really um, interested in, in me and in my life and, and all of that. So it seemed really perfect for like two months. And then I guess it had an expiration date. Um, about two months in, I uh, was finally able to put my finger on something that I had kind of had some inklings about, but really didn't, you know, have the words to describe. And that is that I was and continue to be a queer person. I'm a gay man, and um, I realized this about two months into being an evangelical Christian, and quickly realized this was going to be an issue. Uh, just a little issue. Uh, I um, really struggled with that for a number of years. I, um, you know, I think that the unfortunate thing is that this very conservative, very sort of closed community that I became a part of um, provided, uh, you know, when I realized I was gay, I, I ha didn't know what to think about it because, you know, this was pre-Will and Grace America. <laughs> and even by the time Will and Grace was on TV once a week, they lived in these fancy New York apartments, and I was some, you know, awkward, queer, 11-year-old. I couldn't relate to that life. Um, so I just didn't know any LGBT people. I didn't see representations. And so I was very confused when I realized I was queer. And this community suggested that there was a way to resolve that um, through prayer and other religious practices. And uh, so I tried that. And it's 
spoiler alert, it didn't work. <laughs> um, but I felt like I had failed somehow because it didn't work. And so I, as the years went on and this continued to be a struggle for me, I felt more and more like, um, you know, I was being rejected by God and that, you know, I just, I, I, I was very upset by the whole experience. And um, by the time I became a freshman in high school, I was just completely, um, I had distanced myself from the community that I had become a part of um, and spent most of my time in sort of, uh, you know, alone in solitary reflection and prayer and fasting. And, you know, the, the sort of great irony of the situation is that I became an evangelical Christian because I was looking for community, but in fact, sort of retreated further within myself and became more cut off from uh, my friends and family. And I was also looking for a way to make sense of suffering, but it actually just increased my suffering. <laughs> so um, by the time I was a freshman in high school, I was you know, in a very bad place. Um, and my mother found this journal I was keeping detailing my struggle, um, which you know, at the time, of course, I was absolutely horrified that she found this and read this. But um, it ended up being a very good thing because she basically went to the phone book called up churches in the community until she found a pastor that she was satisfied would um, give me a response that affirmed who I was and uh, took me to meet with him the next day. And that moment really turned my life around in some pretty significant ways. I moved into progressive Christianity and became very involved in affirming churches uh, for the remainder of high school. And the way that I kind of rationalized these really um, dark couple of years I had was by thinking that you know perhaps um, the reason I had suffered so much around these issues was because, um, you know, perhaps I was given those experiences by a divine source in order to um, better understand the experience of suffering and be a more empathetic person, right? That I, um, essentially I thought, you know, with these experiences, I want to sort of take them and use them um, to help other people who are suffering and to work in solidarity with people who suffer and who are um, disenfranchised. So I decided I was going to go to college to study religion and then go from there into seminary and become a minister and work in a Christian church, in a Lutheran church specifically, because I lived in Minnesota and there's lots of Lutherans there. Um, and uh, you know, I just I find I was like, all right, cool. I know who I am. I know what I want to do. This is great. So I went to college, started studying religion, and in my first semester, I stopped believing in God. <laughs> I know, you keep thinking this story is going to end, but no, there's always, <laughs> always something else. Um, so I stopped believing in God, and you know, just really quickly, I think there were sort of two primary reasons for that. The first was I started studying religion academically, and what I was taught by the churches I was a part of um, was just a very sort of narrow uh, window into um, the formation of Christianity, uh, which is the community I was a part of. So the more I learned about it, the more I started to wonder how true I thought some of the things I had been taught uh, growing up were. Uh, but the, I think, bigger factor was that my Christian professors actually encouraged me to take a critical look at my initial conversion experience around the age of 11 and to ask myself what it was that brought me into Christianity. And when I realized through this investigation that they prompted um, that it had been more about the community and about trying to make sense of suffering and that the sort of theological commitments of Christianity had never really sat as comfortably with me um, that, you know, I would watch people talk in tongues and be like, what is happening? Or, you know, I would, um, I would, you know, I grew up not believing in God and so it just kind of felt like these were beliefs that I took on because it was a package deal. I wanted these other things that came with it so I kind of just needed to take the whole package. But when I realized that that wasn't the case, uh, my religious beliefs dropped away pretty quickly. But because we live in a world that is so polarized around these kinds of issues and you know, is defined kind of by an us versus them attitude often when it comes to religious differences, I really didn't know what I, what I sh should feel about religion. You know, I, once I sort of rejected the truth claims of various religious traditions, I didn't know what I thought about religion as a general phenomenon and I didn't know what role I thought it should play in the world or if it should exist at all. And, you know, I stayed in the religion program in part because it was the smallest major at my college, if I'm going to be honest, but also because I was very interested in 
religion and why people um, and you know I became that you know guy in the religious class with a bunch of Christians who was you know uh, arguing with everyone very um, kind of aggressively and um, you know, I, but then when it came to my sort of interpersonal life, I didn't know how to talk to religious people about their beliefs because I felt like either, you know, this is something that I wholly reject or it's, you know, or uh, it's something I wholly embrace. And I just didn't feel like there was any middle ground there. So I worked, you know, a few days a week with a community of um, Muslims in Minneapolis um, through a civic engagement program at my college. but. You know, I, I and I became very close with members of that community. But when things regarding uh, their religious beliefs came up, I would always change the subject because I just felt like I didn't know how to talk about it. I could talk about religion in the classroom, I could study it in the library, but when it came to how it played out in the real world, I was very uncomfortable with navigating those conversations. And it was only after I graduated from college and started to have some more experiences with people who are religious, and um, you know, started to reflect a little bit on, on some of the ways in which I kind of missed opportunities to have discussions with religious people that would help me understand a little bit more why they believe what they believe, uh, that I decided I wanted to take another look at religion and wanted to try to understand a little bit more why religious communities exist and what role they play in people's lives. So I decided to go to seminary to study alongside religious people um, who were training for ordained religious leadership for that reason, so that I could speak with them and learn from them about what it was that was, you know, bringing them into this work and, and how they envisioned their work and how religious communities function. And around that time, I, right as I was preparing to go to grad school, I read this book by um, a man named Ibu Patel. Is anyone familiar with him or his work? Okay, so he wrote a book called Acts of Faith. and. Um, in it, he presented a model um, of religious conflict that was different than models I had heard before. When I heard about religious conflict, I heard it through this um, sort of lens of a clash of civilizations, right? Essentially, that there's this, this narrative, this meme in our culture that suggests that religious differences necessarily end in conflict, right? That, you know, Christians and Muslims will always be in conflict with one another until one side wins out, or, um, you know, we hear it often in the media in terms of Islam versus the West, or these kinds of narratives, but he proposed a slightly different look that I found very compelling. Uh, and in this book he wrote, 100 years ago, the great African-American scholar W.E.B. Uh, w. E. Du Bois famously said, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. I believe that the 21st century will be shaped by the question of the faith line. On one side of the faith line are the religious totalitarians. Their conviction is that only one interpretation of one religion is a legitimate way of being, believing, and belonging on earth, and that everybody else needs to be either cowed or converted or condemned or killed. On the other side of the faith line are the pluralists, who hold that people believing in different creeds and belonging to different communities need to learn to live together. Religious pluralism is neither mere coexistence, nor is it forced consensus. It is a form of proactive cooperation that affirms the identity of the constituent communities while emphasizing that the well-being of each and all depends on the health of the whole. It is the belief that the common good is best served when each community has a chance to make its unique contribution. So this was a model that really resonated with me. It, it felt, on the one hand, kind of optimistic, but it also felt um, it, like it was potentially achievable. Um, and so I, after reading his book, decided that I wanted to explore this idea of interfaith dialogue and interfaith cooperation as an atheist and see what place there was for me in that kind of work and whether there was a place for me in that kind of work. So I got involved in interfaith work and it became very clear to me right away that interfaith dialogue strives to humanize religious diversity, that essentially it, stri it, it strives to create opportunities for people of different religious backgrounds to come together and hear one another's stories and experiences for the sake of just understanding one another better and um, being able to put a face and a name onto different groups of people with, um, that you might otherwise be somewhat unfamiliar with. Um, 
And through building these bridges between people of different identities, um, it establishes a, a opportunities for people to identify shared values across their lines of, of religious difference. And then once those shared values have been identified, it, it encourages people to then move into civic engagement and social action um, to sort of collaborate around those shared values and try to make a positive difference in the world. So that really, um, that part of interfaith seemed very uh, appealing to me and very useful. Um, but I had some questions about interfaith on the other hand. I wondered if it was kind of a, a kumbaya club, I guess, if you will. Uh, if it was about consensus and agreement only, and if there was sort of no room for disagreement. In other words, if it was a no criticism club, uh, no criticism allowed. I wondered if it was um, about sort of privileging and lifting up faith, religious faith, as something that is um, superior to, you know, atheism, or if it was about, you know, or if it would require that atheism be a religion in order to participate. Um, and my experience has shown me that those concerns, you know, they are based in a little bit of reality. Um, there is some of that in interfaith circles, but I feel like the interfaith movement has changed really significantly over the last couple of decades and moved away from models that suggest that we all believe in the same God, if you will, um, and which obviously is not a model that I, as an atheist, can really plug into, and one that's more about uh, trying to humanize diversity and create opportunities for people to focus on shared values, not necessarily shared beliefs. And, you know, I think that some of those concerns that I had um, are actually more likely to be, um, to play out, to be real, if atheists don't participate in interfaith work, right? It, if there are no atheists involved in interfaith work, it's much easier for interfaith groups to say, well, the one thing that unites us is faith, is this sort of shared, you know, we all believe in the same God, if you will, or whatever, um, that if atheists don't participate in interfaith work, that, you know, those things are much more likely to occur. So I've spent the last few years um, very actively trying to encourage more atheists, humanists, and the non-religious to be involved in interfaith work. And there are kind of four primary reasons why I think it's very valuable for atheists to be involved in interfaith work, and I just want to run through those relatively quickly. I realize our attention spans are increasingly limited these days. I should just be tweeting this speech, probably. <laughs> um, but I'll go through them as quickly as I can, because I also want to make sure we have time for some discussion, because um, I want to hear a little bit of what you all have to say, if I can. So the first reason is that Atheists are hugely outnumbered. For all the gains that you know, atheists have made in terms of visi visibility in recent years, um, you know, they're still far from uh, being close to uh, majority in any way. Um, while there was a Pew study released a few weeks ago that found that one in five Americans are identify as religiously unaffiliated, only 12% of that one in five identifies atheist, and only 17% identifies agnostic. But even more interestingly, among that 12 and 17%, 36% of those people claim to believe in God or a universal spirit. So, I can't actually really give you an exact number of how many atheists or agnostics there are, but it's still very small. It, um, in terms of people who are uh, you know, responding to surveys, saying that they are an atheist or an agnostic. Um, and in fact, you know, well, religion looks pretty different today than it has in the past. It is, you know, very clear that it's not about to sort of vanish or disappear. Uh, in fact, there was another Pew study done in 2010 on American millennials, uh, people under the age of 30. Um, and that study found that, um, that the intensity of religious millennials, religious affiliation is as strong today as it was among previous generations when they were young. And that levels of certainty of belief in God have actually increased among religious millennials from previous generations. And that religious millennials are more inclined than their elders to believe that their own religion is the one true path to eternal life. <laughs> so, you know, sociologists once predicted that religion would necessarily decline as a result of modernization, but in recent decades, both in the United States and around the world, uh, some religious denominations have remained 
relatively steady, and others, uh, particularly more conservative or fundamentalist groups, have actually grown uh, very rapidly, um, both domestically and abroad. Um, Peter Berger uh, is a sociologist who wrote that most sociologists of religion have looked at the world and concluded that the secularization theory, that is the thesis that modernization necessarily leads to a decline of religion, does not fit the facts of the matter. And psychologist David M. Wolf agrees, saying at a point in human history when many thought that religion was on its way out, a casualty of science and rationality, we are witnessing a worldwide resurgence of fundamentalism on the one hand, and a virtual explosion of interest in the new spirituality on the other. And I think that that, is, that accounts for many of the religiously unaffiliated, um, the one in five Americans would probably be, a number of them would be likely to identify as spiritual but not religious. So that's number one. There's not many, in, in other words, there's not very many atheists. So <laughs> it's important that those of us who do identify as atheist, agnostic, or humanist find opportunities to be visible, to let people know that we're here, to share some of our stories and kind of humanize atheism because um, a lot of people just don't really think of atheists and agnostics or really know that we are here. The second reason is that many atheists, including myself, want to end religious extremism and promote social justice. And the interfaith movement is inherently rooted in an anti-fundamentalism framework. It's kind of part of, it's a, a central aspect of what interfaith sets out to do. Uh, there was a book written called Ethnic Conflict and Civic Life, Hindus and Muslims in India. And in this book, it found that the likelihood that inciting events would lead to widespread or long-term violence um, was significantly less in communities where civic ties across lines of identity differences were present. So in other words, in communities where there were Muslims and Hindus, um, when there were proactive, intentional efforts made to build bridges between these communities, to get to know one another, to build friendships, um, it was much less likely when an inciting incident would occur that it would result in violence. But in populations where those ties didn't exist, inciting incidents would provoke extensive inter-identity violence. So interfaith cooperation is about creating opportunities for people to build those kinds of relationships between different groups um, in order to build trust and um, understanding so that when conflicts arise between different groups or relating to different groups, um, those kind of relationships are present that will help um, pre prevent that kind of violence. Similarly, um, Religious communities do a very good job, traditionally, of promoting and supporting social justice. Um, you look at a number of social justice movements in uh, just the history of the United States, and many of them were fronted by, coordinated by, organized by people of faith and faith communities, such as the Civil Rights Movement, which was an interfaith movement led by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and supported by uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, and, um, and Martin Luther King Jr. drew inspiration from the nonviolence of Mahatma Gandhi in India and he supported the efforts of Thich Nhat Hanh in Vietnam for nonviolence. And so there is a sort of great history of that sort of thing. And in 2010, there was a book that came out called American Grace by Robert Putnam and David Campbell, who's a, one of the largest studies of the lives of religious Americans. And that book found that, in fact, religious Americans are much more civically engaged than the non-religious. They're more likely to vote, they're more likely to run for political office, they're more likely to take on leadership roles in their community, they're more likely to volunteer their time, they're more likely to uh, give to charity, both religious charity and secular charity, but that the, what they found was the correlation between religiosity and civic engagement actually was not a correlation relating to the intensity of an individual's religious belief, in other words, how sort of devoutly religious they were, but it was correlated with how involved they were in their religious communities, how connected they were with the community. And the book actually suggested that non-religious communities could serve a, same fu a similar function for non-religious Americans. Uh, that communities that provide outlets and opportunities for civic engagement and words of encouragement and inspiration that have a non-religious foundation could serve a similar function. So that is a part of why I'm involved in the humanist community at Harvard, and it's also a part of why I or help organize interfaith initiatives that create opportunities for people of all different religious backgrounds and the non-religious to be civically engaged. 
The third reason is that Interfaith is an educational program, uh, Interfaith Dialogue. In other words, it gives people the opportunity to come together, meet one another, and learn from one another. Um, religious literacy in this country is abysmally low. Uh, people know very little about religion. They know very little about their own religions. They know very little about other people's religions. And interfaith dialogue is a great way for people to meet and learn from other uh, people from other communities and learn about traditions that they maybe don't know that much about. Uh, Carl Sagan is one of my personal heroes. Um, I have a tattoo on my arm of some of his words. There are many other tattoos that are covered up because I'm being professional right now. Um, and he once said that every one of us in the cosmic perspective is precious, and if a human disagrees with you, let him live. In a hundred billion galaxies, you will not find another. I love that quote, and I agree with the sentiment of it, but, and not to suggest he wouldn't, but I would actually like to go a step further and say that I actually don't want to just let those who disagree with me live. I want to go out of my way to befriend them and try to understand them and learn from them. Um, and in fact, I think some of my greatest uh, sort of insights and learning have grown out of relationships with people who don't see eye to eye with me on a number of issues or who, you know, identify in a different way than I do. In E Pluribus Unum, Diversity and Community in the 21st Century, which was a paper by Robert uh, Putnam, he uh, wrote that diversity is important to building strong and sustainable communities. In fact, that communities are stronger if they have diversity of all kinds, including religious diversity. But at least at first, people tend to sort of hunker down with those who are very similar to themselves, and they gaze upon people from other groups with suspicion. So in order for diversity to flower and to be this thing that makes communities stronger, we have to actually make intentional efforts for people to go out of their way and learn from one another um, and learn what uh, strengths diversity can provide for communities. The fourth and final reason, which I think is one of the most important, is personally, is that atheists um, are very distrusted and very marginalized in the United States and surely in many other parts of the world as well. Um, and because atheists represent such a small sliver of the general population, um, it is, I think, thus imperative for atheists to find opportunities such as an interfaith dialogue to, to allow themselves to be humanized and allow atheism to be seen as something that isn't uh, scary. <laughs> Um, a 2010 Gallup poll demonstrated something that the LGBT community has known for a long time, that people are significantly more inclined to oppose gay marriage if they don't actually know anyone who's gay. I, you know, I don't think anyone in here will be surprised to learn that. Um, and so for that reason, I think it's very important for atheists to build intentional relationships with people who are uh, religious. Similarly, a Time Magazine cover story that came out that year uh, featured revealing numbers that speak at volumes, I think, about the correlation between positive relationships and general civic support. For their survey in 2010, 46% of Americans thought that Islam was more violent than other faiths, and 61% opposed the construction of Park 51 or the so-called Ground Zero Mosque, which was, of course, not that I even need to say it, not a mosque, nor was it at Ground Zero. <laughs> that being said, there were many other bad things about that issue. Uh, but they also found that only 37% of respondents claim to even know a Muslim American. So we're not talking about even you know having a close friend who is a Muslim, but 37% of those who responded said that they had they had met a Muslim at some point. So to, and then right around that same time, Pew also replete, uh, released a survey that found that 55% of Americans claimed to know not very much or nothing at all about Islam. So to me, the disconnect is very clear when only 37% of Americans have ever met a Muslim. And when 55% claim that they know very little or nothing about Islam, the sort of negative stereotypes that get pushed out via the media um, go unchallenged. And I think the same logic can be extended to atheists and agnostics. The fewer relationships uh, that we have with people of faith, the more these negative stereotypes of atheists as disengaged, nihilistic, mean-spirited, baby eaters, whatever, uh, will go unchallenged. Um, and I think by building coalitions and letting ourselves be known by the religious, we will deconstruct those stereotypes and we will ensure our protection and our respect from others. In other words, 
if someone goes to an interfaith event and they meet me and I say, hi, I'm Chris, I'm an atheist, and here's a little bit about who I am, mm -hmm. and maybe we get along a little bit, then I have a person that they associate that with. Uh, so when they hear the word atheist on TV, um, you know, they no longer just think of this amorphous group of people that they know nothing about. They have to think of at least one person, and hopefully there will be more than just me at interfaith events being an atheist. <laughs> so they'll, you know, come to think of a group of people. <laughs> the last of those four reasons that I provided is one of the reasons why I find some of the current sort of public narrative about atheism to be a little bit problematic because I think in some ways it kind of reinforces the stereotypes that exist about atheists as being mean-spirited or sort of fixated on, on, on you know, people's religious beliefs and maybe as sort of taking an unfair generalizing look at religion. And what I think has unfortunately happened is in the public discourse, atheism and religion have become sort of pitted as these um, forces that are duking it out until one wins out. Um, and it becomes just these e extreme positions talking past one another where people aren't actually really sitting down and listening to one another and getting to know each other. You know, Carl Sagan, again, one of my favorites, once wrote that the chief deficiency I see in the skeptical movement is its polarization, us versus them, the sense that we have a monopoly on the truth and that those other people who believe in all those stupid doctrines are morons, that if you're sensible, you'll listen to us, and if not, to hell with you. This is non-constructive. It does not get our message across and it condemns us to a permanent minority status. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. And of course, atheists and agnostics are not the only ones who are guilty of this kind of behavior. Surely, we can all think of anyone from a number of different communities that engaged in this way. Need I mentioned the Westboro Baptist Church. But I do think what we need is people on all sides who are more willing to listen and to try to understand people's differences rather than to steamroll or dismiss anyone who belongs to a category that they don't belong to. This doesn't mean that we should wallpaper over our differences or whitewash them or ignore them or pretend that they're not there. In fact, I think we should we need to be talking about what these differences are. But I think we also need to be looking for where our points of agreement are, what our common ground is, and we need to take that and act on it. Because in a divisive and conflict-driven world, it can be much harder to find the common ground, it can seem counterintuitive to look for it, but I think because the world is so polarized around religious issues, it is that much more important that we seek it out. So, while I was in seminary, I took a preaching class for the heck of it. I think I was like just curious what my life would have been like had I gone into that. And it was a very interesting experience. I was, you know, it was me and a bunch of Christians, and for like the majority of the course, they were like, how is what you're doing preaching if you're not religious, and why, you know, how is it not just public speaking? And I didn't really have an answer. I said, I just want to take the class, <laughs> but what I learned in my preaching class, I, I mean, I learned a number of things, but one of the things I learned is, you know, the um, significance of stories, right, of, of using stories to try to illuminate the point that you're trying to make, and they taught me to always open with stories, which I tried to do today, and weave stories in, but then always end with a story, so if you'll humor me, I have one more story to share. Are we all okay? Yeah. If you're not okay, you can tell me. <laughs> okay, so when I was getting ready to leave my um, work in Chicago for the Interfaith Youth Corps and move out here to New England to work at Harvard, I, you know, went through this series of having to say goodbye to friends that I'd met while I was living in Chicago. And one of my friends I met um, at a Catholic seminary course, and he had never met an atheist before, and, but we were both from Minnesota, so that kind of brought us together. We both had that, my Minnesotan accent was a little thicker back then, um, it was a bit more of, oh yeah, sure, hey, uh, oh great, now I'm going to be stuck with it for the rest of this talk. Uh, once you turn it on, there's no turning it off. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I think it's better. So, we were both from Minnesota. Um, he had never met an atheist, but he had also never met a, or claimed to, or had, you know, didn't know he had met anyone who was LGBT. So these were sort of two things that we would talk about a fair amount. And um, you know, I found him to be very 
respectful and very curious and very open-minded, and we actually developed a really great friendship. And so on one of my last days in Chicago, he and I also happened to live in the same neighborhood. So we decided to go to this bar, and it, he always wanted to go to this bar. It was a gay bar. And I think he was like kind of going out of his way to be, you know, he was overcompensating a little. He was trying to be nice. He's like, we'll go to the gay bar. <laughs> and, you know, I, I didn't care if we went to a gay bar, but whatever, it was fine. I kind of liked to see his reaction when people would hit on him. <laughs> and, um, you know, we were having this great discussion and we were reflecting on the last few years of our friendship. And um, it turned out someone had been eavesdropping and he, this guy kind of, I could tell eventually that he was kind of listening in and I tried to sort of say with my eyes, like, it's okay to come over if you're curious. Um, so, I, but I don't know how well that worked, but he did eventually come over, so maybe. Um, and he, you know, admitted he'd been eavesdropping and he was like, you know, I find what you guys are talking about really interesting, but one thing I just can't get my mind around is like why you, as somebody who identifies an atheist, as an atheist, is so interested in this idea of interfaith work. And, you know, so I, I said, fair question. And we talked about it for a while. And we ended up discussing a whole range of topics. And eventually he posed this question to me. He said, okay, it's all interesting and you know, good for you, but you know, I want to know something. Okay, so tell me this, Mr. Atheist. And he actually called me Mr. Atheist. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get a t-shirt or like a business card or something like that on it. It's, it's a cool title. He said, okay, tell me this, Mr. Atheist. Where did we come from? How did all of this get here? So, you know, just a little question. <laughs> I had the answer to, and now I'm going to tell you. <laughs> um, what I responded with was, you know, I started by responding, well, I'm not a scientist, which is like my favorite line if I'm asked a question that I don't know the answer to. I can just be like, well, I'm not a scientist, so you can take what I say with a grain of salt. But then I actually continued, you know, to be honest, that question of, you know, where we came from or how all this got here um, doesn't actually really matter all that much to me. You know, I think it's an interesting question, and at certain points in my life I've been very interested in the question. And I think that the study of the uh, origins of our universe can shed a lot of light on our, um, you know, on, on our existence in the here and now. I didn't say all that at the time, but this is me adding this. But you know, given, I'm, I'm not actually all that interested in how we got here. What concerns me, given that we are here, is what will we do? I mean, that was essentially my response is, you know, it's an interesting question, but I'm more interested in what we'll do since, as far as I can tell, we're here. About a year later, famed theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking made headlines around the world when he said during an interview that he didn't believe in an afterlife. But in my mind, the most important point of that interview was among the most overlooked. In a blink and you'll miss it moment, he offered an imperative call to action. He was asked, so here we are, what should we do? And he responded, we should seek the greatest value of our action. So I guess the question, if I can leave you with one question, if that's all right, that I want to leave you with is, given that we are here, what will we do? What is the greatest value of our action? I am not a scientist. <laughs> but I believe that the beginning of finding the answer to that question is as simple as seeking to try to understand the diverse people who are here with us and working with them to advance social justice equality for all people. Despite areas of disagreement, significant and real as they are, we must find ways to build understanding across lines of religious difference and work together to improve the world now. We may not agree on the existence of God or an afterlife, but we can agree that life in the here and now will require that we find a way to live together and work alongside one another. I think that the first step is, share, is meeting people who have different religious beliefs and sharing stories with one another. And that's what I've tried to do tonight. And I thank you for listening. Sociologist Marshall Gans has written that stories are what enable us to communicate our values to one another. And psychologist Dan P. McAdams agrees, saying narrative guides behavior in every moment and frames not only how we see the past, but how we see ourselves in the future. 
So the final, final question I want to leave you with tonight. I can do this for a long time, but I, this really is the last, the last of it. Um, is what future will we imagine for ourselves and for the world? Is it a pessimistic future in which the religious and the secular or di people of different religious backgrounds will continuously come into conflict with one another, where religion is nothing more than this problem to be eradicated that will miraculously make the world a better place? Or in the words of Ibu Patel, can we take religious conflict or religious difference and religious disagreement, which is in many parts of the world a bomb of destruction or a barrier of division, and can we find a way to make religious differences a bridge of cooperation? I think we can, if we begin by listening to more stories of people who have different experiences and backgrounds, and then act together on the shared values that they communicate. Thank you. Mm. Glad you're here. I'm a member of the Pioneer Valley Secularists. Mm. We've only been around for maybe a year or so. Happy one year anniversary. <laughs> Thank you. And um, we've just started, basically we're a meetup group, mm. and um, one of our members actually got us involved. We haven't done it yet, but uh, working with an interfaith organization in Northampton mm -hmm. that um, to serve meals uh, to people who are at the shelter there and um, I what you were saying about talking to the interfaith community and working with them I find very interesting because um, the whole thing with the stereotype that atheists have no morals and no sure. values this is really important and in my family, either people like my mother and myself are not religious, or on the other end, um, there are people who are evangelical. And um, so I always have this sort of like trepidation initially about being judged um, by people who are religious. That somewhere in the back of their minds, they're pr they're praying for me, Correct. which <laughs> is really irritating. Yeah. Um, at least the people in my family don't tell me they're praying for me, even though I'm sure they are. That's good. I did have a friend who told me that she was doing that, and we are not friends anymore. But um, I think this is a really good point. What you and you reminded me. I can't believe that this isn't really in my head so clearly until you said it about. Uh, interfaith groups working together in um, in the 60s, Dr. King and all of that. And I remember how important that was to me when I was a child just to hear about it. And it's sort of all coming back to me now a little bit more clearly and in connection with being an atheist when you talk about working um, with people who are religious but are not of the kind where um, it's all black and white. Uh, I think that's really important, and I'm really glad that you're focusing on that. Well, thank you, and I'm also very glad to hear about your group's existence, and I'm excited to hear um, about the potential for some work with the interfaith group there. And I would love to um, speak with you more either later today, or um, if you want to follow up with me after the event um, over email or something, but I'd love to stay in touch and hear more about how that goes, and um, just would to stay updated on that. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, you know, we were talking earlier about, uh, you know, struggling to provide a certain amount of translation mm -hmm. for folks who um, may really need organizations, as you did at one point in your life, you know, um, that have very strong religious-based um, but that community, that sense of community that uh, we all seek, you know, I mean, it's, and, and I was fascinated that it was the academic look at religion that, that kind of brought you to that, oh, okay, wait, God, I can read about it and understand it a little better. Um, and, but that happens in college for most people. And I guess the question for me, you know, I have I have teenage daughters and you know, last night I'm I'm being read Job because she's studying it in high school. My you know, my oldest is studying it in high school and 
you know, she's saying, why was God such a jerk, you know? What was up with, what was up with that <laughs> God? You know, and it was great. It was fun <laughs> to... reflect on, but I joke, the book of Job was my favorite It's part. a terrifically, it's one of the most beautifully written parts <laughs> of the Bible. And that was it. You know, I studied the Bible in college, you know, so I was able to say, well, yes, that, you know, Christianity came out of that because that was, that was, a, that was a really obnoxious God. And, and, you know, people needed that that attempt to communicate with God a little more directly and, and um, without that personality problem. So, you know, this is an interesting thing that I can talk to my child about, and yet this is not something that's going to happen in a classroom necessarily um, where somebody's studying the Bible, even, even in a high school like Amherst High School where they're studying the Bible. It's not going to happen in a, in, a, in a church, you know, Sunday school. It's not going to happen in... Um, you know, so I guess the interfaith dialogue, the question I, for you is, how do we initiate interfaith dialogue among young people, as opposed to when you reach this place where, okay, I can look at religion academically in college. I right? mean sort of like pre-college. Right, right. How do you attempt to reach folks who don't even know what interfaith means? Sure. You know. So, you know, I work in this community at Harvard, and one of the biggest parts of my job is organizing some of our civic engagement programs, many of which are interfaith mm -hmm. community service programs. Mm -hmm. And those are programs that are um, for people of all ages. So we'll get a lot of ch people coming who have children of many different ages, mm -hmm. and they bring them to these events. And a big part of the event is um, is a, a sort of interfaith dialogue component that asks, it, it, it asks people to reflect on why they're participating in this, um, what connection it does or doesn't have to a religious background or a religious identification, and um, you know what, um, and then it invites people to ask other people for more information about their religious beliefs. In other words, it's you know it's a great opportunity when you're working on like for example one of our programs is a meal packaging program. We're doing one next month that is uh, going to package 40,000 meals for food insecure children in Massachusetts. So it's like an assembly li line format and you're across from a stranger and it, you know, you're encouraged to ask like them. Like speed dating. Them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's kind of a speed okay. faith thing. Or yeah, speed speed faith, yeah. <laughs> but that's great. And um, that is really an all ages thing and we have a lot of kids that come and a lot of the kids that come um, are either from members of our humanist community mm -hmm. who have children or they're from members of religious communities that are participating. Um, that ha also have children. So I do think that this being connected to some kind of community of common belief is one of the easiest ways to be civically engaged. And in fact, that's, you know, as I mentioned, that um, was a big finding in American Grace, mm -hmm. um, was that people who are connected to these kinds of communities are much more involved and they have much more opportunities to be involved. So similarly, I think for these kind of interfaith dialogues, one of the easiest ways to get young people involved is if they are already connected to some kind of community, when that community encourages them or even organizes those kinds of opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's one of the best ways. Yeah. So since you're working at Harvard. Uh, Wait, sorry, uh, can I get sorry. your name? Arjun. <laughs> My name is Arjun, I go to Amherst College. Um, I'm, I'm interested in um, how you reach out specifically to students at Harvard, sure. and, you know, in that sort of, uh, you know, busy college setting. Yeah. Outside of, you mentioned it's very easy if they're already a part of some group, you just sort of send the word out and sure. it gets mm -hmm. naturally disseminated. But how do you how do you pull in new new people from the college? Well, community? one of the things we try to do is offer a diverse slate of programs um, that, and some of which will sort of co-sponsor with other groups, which makes it easier for people to find out about them. But you know, we try to do we have weekly discussions, we have films, we have. Um, community service projects, but then we also have these like, we have a couple really big events where we bring in big speakers um, that uh, are somehow connected to some of the issues we're talking about. So this year we're doing a kind of a theme year of programming around humanism and love. And every year we give out um, two awards. One is the Humanist of the Year Award and one is the um, Lifetime Achievement and Cultural Humanism Award. So that second award has gone to people like Joss Whedon, um, yes, I know. I have a big poster of him right by my desk. <laughs> and Buffy well, is right there with a the knife. No tattoo. Um, <laughs> and um, we gave it to the Mythbusters and, you know, etc. cetera. Uh, and then the Humanist of the Year Award is a sort of similar award. And, and this year, the Humanist of the Year Award is going to the founders of OKCupid. Um, <laughs> in part because they help people connect 
in this digital age where it's, you know, we can connect with each other in many new ways. Um, but also because their site uh, is um, one of the biggest ways that atheists and humanists um, find relationships, um, both with one another but also just in general. So anyway, those kinds of events, which are tend to be a little more high profile, are an opportunity for us to let people know, hey, we're here and not only do we do these big events, but we also have all these weekly programs going on and stuff like that. But it can be really hard. Um, to get the word out because people are so busy, because there are so many student groups and so many different you know groups providing people things. But our group has grown really exponentially um, in recent years, and I think it's because people want to have a community where they feel like they are um, sort of joined by some kind of common values or some kind of like um, shared principles. You know, we have all these discussion groups where people will um, you know sort of vigorously discuss or debate what an ethical life outside of religion looks like. And, um, you know, I think that even though there's a lot of disagreement there, people really like the fact that they can come to this meeting and feel like, okay, I'm going to be around some people who think a little bit like I do. Um, and so, you know, that in that way, we just kind of need to let people know that we're there. and. You know, we use all the typical emails and social media and postering and whatever, but at the end of the day, I think what makes the difference is if you're offering programs that people actually want. So when I organize programs, it's very much, um, you know, I, I organize programs that people ask me to organize. So I don't just come up with something on my own because I think it's a good idea. I, I, I try to listen to people and ask them what they're wanting to do. Glad you're here. I'm a member of the Pioneer Valley Secularists. Mm. You've only been around for maybe a year or so. Happy one year anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And um, we've just started, basically we're a meetup group, mm. and um, one of our members actually got us involved. We haven't done it yet, but f uh, working with an interfaith organization in Northampton mm. that um, to serve meals uh, to people who are at the shelter there. And um, I, what you were saying about talking to the interfaith community and working with them, I find very interesting because um, the whole thing with the stereotype that atheists have no morals and no sure. values, this is really important. And in my family, either people like my mother, myself, are not religious, or on the other end, um, there are people who are evangelical. And um, so I always have this sort of like trepidation initially about being judged um, by people who are religious. That somewhere in the back of their minds they're, pr they're praying for me, Correct. which <laughs> is really irritating. Yeah. Um, at least the people in my family don't tell me they're praying for me, even though I'm sure they are. That's good. I did have a friend who told me that she was doing that, and we are not friends anymore. But um, I think this is a really good point, what you, and you reminded me, I can't believe that this isn't really in my head so clearly until you said it, about uh, interfaith groups working together in, um, in the 60s, Dr. King and all of that. And I remember how important that was to me when I was a child just to hear about it. And it's sort of all coming back to me now a little bit more clearly and in connection with being an atheist when you talk about working um, with people who are religious but are not of the kind where um, it's all black and white. Uh, I think that's really important. And I'm really glad that you're focusing on that. Well, thank you. And I'm also very glad to hear about your group's existence and I'm excited to hear for some work with the interfaith group there. And I would love to um, speak with you more either later today or um, if you want to follow up with me after the event um, over email or something, but I'd love to stay in touch and hear more about how that goes and um, just would like to stay updated on that. Thank you. Yeah? Hi. Um, you know, we were talking earlier about, uh, you know, struggling to provide a certain amount of translation mm -hmm. for folks who um, may really need organizations as you 
did at one point in your life, you know, um, that have very strong religious base. Um, but that community, that sense of community that uh, we all seek, you know, I mean, it's, and, and I was fascinated that it was the academic look at religion that, that kind of brought you to that, oh, okay, wait, God, I can read about it and understand it a little better. Um, and, but that happens in college for most people. And I guess the question for me, you know, I have, I have teenage daughters and, you know, last night I'm, I'm being read Job because she's studying it in high school. And my, you know, my oldest is studying it in high school. And, you know, she's saying, why was God such a jerk, you know? What was up with, the, what was up with that I God? You know, and it was great, it was fun to... reflect on, but Job, the book of Job is my favorite It's book. a terrifically, it's one of the most beautifully written parts of the Bible, and that was it. You know, I studied the Bible in college, you know, so I was able to say, well, yes, that, you know, Christianity came out of that because that was, that was, a, that was a really obnoxious God, and, and, you know, people needed that that attempt to communicate with God a little more directly and, and um, without that personality problem. So, you know, this is an interesting thing that I can talk to my child about, and yet this is not something that's going to happen in a classroom necessarily um, where somebody's studying the Bible, even, even in a high school like Amherst High School where they're studying the Bible. It's not going to happen in a, in, a, in a church, you know, Sunday school. It's not going to happen in... Um, you know, so I guess the interfaith dialogue, the question I, for you is how do we initiate interfaith dialogue among young people as opposed to when you reach this place where, okay, I can look at religion academically in college. I mean sort of like pre-college. Right, right. How do you attempt to reach folks who don't even know what interfaith means? Sure. You know. So, you know, I work in this community at Harvard, and one of the biggest parts of my job is organizing some of our civic engagement programs, many of which are interfaith mm -hmm. community service programs. Mm -hmm. And those are programs that are um, for people of all ages. So we'll get a lot of ch people coming who have children of many different ages, mm -hmm. and they bring them to these events. And a big part of the event is um, is a, a sort of interfaith dialogue component that asks, it, it, it asks people to reflect on why they're participating in this, um, what connection it does or doesn't have to a religious background or a religious identification, and um, you know what, um, and then it invites people to ask other people for more information about their religious beliefs. In other words, it's you know it's a great opportunity when you're working on like for example one of our programs is a meal packaging program. We're doing one next month that is uh, going to package 40,000 meals for food insecure children in Massachusetts. So it's like an assembly li line format and you're across from a stranger and it, you know, you're encouraged to ask like them. Speed about dating, them. yeah. That's exactly. Yeah. It's kind of a speed faith thing. Or speed faith yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's great. And um, that is really an all ages thing and we have a lot of kids that come and a lot of the kids that come um, are either from members of our humanist community mm -hmm. who have children or they're from members of religious communities that are participating. Um, that ha also have children. So I do think that this being connected to some kind of community of common belief is one of the easiest ways to be civically engaged. And in fact, that's, you know, as I mentioned, that um, was a big finding in American Grace, mm -hmm. um, was that people who are connected to these kinds of communities are much more involved and they have much more opportunities to be involved. So similarly, I think for these kind of interfaith dialogues, one of the easiest ways to get young people involved is if they are already connected to some kind of community, when that community encourages them or even organizes those kinds of opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's one of the best ways. Yeah. So since you're working at Harvard. Wait, um, sorry, uh, can I get your name? Arjun. <laughs> My name is Arjun. I go to Amherst College. Um, I'm, I'm interested in um, how you reach out specifically to students at Harvard, sure. in, you know, in that sort of uh, you know, busy college setting. Yeah. Outside of, you mentioned it's very easy if they're already part of some group, you just sort of send the word out and sure. it gets mm -hmm. naturally disseminated. But how do you how do you pull in new, new people from the college? Well, community? one of the things we try to do is offer a diverse slate of programs um, that, and some of which will sort of co-sponsor with other groups, which makes it easier for people to find out about them. But, you know, we try to do, we have weekly discussions, we have films, we have, um, community service projects, but then we also have these like 
we have a couple really big events where we bring in big speakers um, that uh, are somehow connected to some of the issues we're talking about. So this year, we're doing a kind of a theme year of programming around humanism and love. And every year we give out um, two awards. One is the Humanist of the Year Award, and one is the um, Lifetime Achievement in Cultural Humanism Award. So that second award has gone to people like Joss Whedon. Um, yes, I know. I have a big poster of him right by my desk. <laughs> and Buffy is right there with the knife. <laughs> um, and um, we gave it to the Mythbusters and, you know, et cetera. Uh, and then the Humanist of the Year Award is a sort of similar award, and, and this year the Humanist of the Year Award is going to the founders of OkCupid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> part because they help people connect in this digital age where it's, you know, we can connect with each other in many new ways. Um, but also because their site uh, is um, one of the biggest ways that atheists and humanists um, find relationships. Um, both with one another, but also just in general. So anyway, those kinds of events, which are tend to be a little more high profile, are an opportunity for us to let people know, hey, we're here, and not only do we do these big events, but we also have all these weekly programs going on and stuff like that. But it can be really hard um, to get the word out because people are so busy, because there are so many student groups and so many different you know groups providing people things. But our group has grown really exponentially um, in recent years, and I think it's because people want to have a community where they feel like they are um, sort of joined by some kind of common values or some kind of like um, shared principles. You know, we have all these discussion groups where people will, um, you know, sort of vigorously discuss or debate what an ethical life outside of religion looks like. And, um, you know, I think that even though there's a lot of disagreement there, people really like the fact that they can come to this meeting and feel like, okay, I'm gonna be around people who think a little bit like I do um, and so you know that in that way we just kind of need to let people know that we're there and you know we use all the typical emails and social media and postering and whatever but at the end of the day I think what makes the difference is if you're offering programs that people actually want so when I organize programs it's very much um, you know I, I organize programs that people ask me to organize so I don't just come up with something on my own because I think it's a good idea. I, I, I try to listen to people and ask them what they're wanting to do. I actually studied like Islamist movements. So that was one of the areas I was interested in. I'm a Christian and I did ethnographic research in Morocco with a practicing Muslim family. Mm -hmm. And something I'm interested in is that um, uh, interfaith work tends to focus on common values, um, which is really good in doing activities together. Um, but I just noticed that our approach in the West tends to be towards the cognitive aspects of religion and what you believe, why you believe it, sure. things like that. And something that I have been exposed to with some Muslims um, has been more an emphasis on the way of life, mm -hmm. like activities, things you do, and challenges that Muslims face here in the US, for instance, with discrimination around the headscarf or not having a place to pray or not being able to get the food that they're you know, allowed to eat. And it's, it's hard for me to wrap my brain around some of these, like, um, real uh, clear decisions about how they want to do day-to-day -day living. But I'm um, curious if that were brought into the interfaith discussion as a way to bypass like, how on earth could you believe that? Like from someone who's not a believer, sure. facing someone who is a believer and saying it just doesn't make sense. If you move past that to more like, well, how do you organize your life? Mm -hmm. and, and look at constitutive things. It could be, I don't know if you had any thoughts about that. I mean, I, I have some thoughts, but mostly I, I think I just um, agree with that you're making. I think that there are sort of multiple ways to bring people into interfaith discussions and, you know, a shared, a kind of shared values or sort of um, origins of morality um, or belief approach is not going to resonate with some people in the same way that uh, that approach would. So I, you know, I, I have actually seen, there's a, I wish, now I'm just going to totally have to be honest and reveal that that speed faithing joke was not original. I, in fact, stole it. <laughs> because uh, there's this series of interfaith leadership institutes put on by my former employer, the Interfaith Youth Corps, um, that I continue to work very closely with them. And they do these a couple times a year, and part of what they do is they do these um, sessions during the conference called Speed Faithing, where you go um, into the room um, for, what is it, like 
15 or 20 minutes, and basically you get a crash course in atheism, even though it's not a faith, like whatever, we just work with it, it's fine. Um, or, you know, Islam or Christianity or whatever, and <coughs> you'll get someone talking from that perspective and saying, here's a little bit about my take on this, but also here are just some sort of general, here's a general knowledge base for, you know, how many Muslims live their lives or what some of the sort of cultural aspects of this tradition are instead of just saying, I am a Muslim and I believe X, Y, and Z because I'm a Muslim. It also kind of gives a sort of broader look at, um, you know, because, you know, as an atheist, that, I, that idea of uh, living your life according to a, a certain set of sort of, you know, cultural principles, it doesn't really make sense with me, for me because I don't, it's very, I, I don't, there's no shared value there because I don't have that same kind of uh, value. Um, I'm very focused on living my life the way that I think is best personally. And so there is a little bit of a barrier there, but by giving me more language to understand um, how other people talk about that, um, given their different context, then it, it helps me to understand a little, little better. A little better, even though maybe experientially, I don't, I can't connect with it. If that makes sense. Yeah. All right. I see two hands. Um, do we have time for two? Yeah, we have time for two. All right. Last two. I don't care who goes first, so you can decide for yourselves. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I have a question about um, how you talked a lot about how how the religious people view atheists differently due to um, well due to interfaith work, and I was wondering how how you began to view religious people differently from doing interfaith mm. work. Well, when I was in college, I um, you know I had I had interactions with religious people, but you know, they sort of occurred in two ways. One was in the classroom when we were kind of just debating our, our beliefs, and um, that didn't really do much for me to sort of humanize religious people because we were kind of just uh, reciting our positions at one another, um, and it wasn't really about a sort of personal interaction. And then the other way that I engaged with religious people was when I would, uh, you know, work, for example, with that Muslim community, but then I would kind of avoid those discussions. Um, so when I recognized that there was potentially some value in these intentional opportunities to try to understand and hear more about people's beliefs and experiences, I actually did find that it complexified my understanding of religion as a social phenomenon, as um, it, it complexified uh, my sort of view on religion uh, and the role that it plays in people's lives. So, you know, I. I think I, before doing interfaith work, I did intellectually understand that people within different religious groups didn't all believe exactly the same thing. But doing interfaith work helped me understand what people's, what people's day in, day out lives were like, very much like what you were talking about. You know, I had no idea what it, what it was like to live as a Muslim woman in the United States um, who was a first generation uh, individual. And I mean, those kinds of, those kinds of uh, understandings were just things that I was completely ignorant uh, about before I started doing interfaith work, and it helped, I think, just broaden my horizons a little bit about um, the role, different roles that religion plays in people's lives and, and the diversity that exists within different religious communities. So I think that is my short answer to your question. Yeah? Um, at different times, you you've used the terms uh, atheist, agnostic, and sure. humanist. And sure. so um, so two questions. One is, I know that the term humanist and what it refers to is, sure. is up for debate. Up for debate, debate. yes. Um, yes so I'm is. wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, sure. and, and the other is, I'm just uh, wondering why you choose atheist. Sure, so very good question, thank you. The term humanist is definitely up for debate. I, when I'm trying to be very specific, I will say secular humanist to differentiate it from religious humanism. Humanism is a, you know, it's a, a long-standing um, ethical system, and um, I tend to draw my understanding of humanism um, from the, uh, well, a number of humanist writers, such as Paul Kurtz, who actually just very, very recently passed away. Um, and also, um, you know, a, a, num a number of different Renaissance thinkers and so 
on, but um, I also really, uh, if I'm looking for sort of a quick and easy way to introduce someone to humanism, I'll often point towards the Humanist Manifestos, which are all available for free on the American Humanist Association's website. If you're curious, they are short reads, I promise. Um, but I think the sort of textbook definition of humanism would, for me anyway, would be an, uh, eth an um, ethical philosophy of life that is rooted in reason and driven by compassion, that rejects um, theism and um, other sort of so-called supernatural beliefs, <coughs> which I recognize that that term is also contentious for some people, but um, but the, it is, it essentially is a philosophy of life that um, underscores that human that human problems need to be solved by humans, and um, uh, and that hum humanity has the uh, ability and the responsibility to uh, resolve those problems. So uh, that is my sort of off-the-cuff definition uh, in terms of how I see it, but I would strongly encourage people to uh, look into it more online because there are more articulate explications uh, available. And one of the reasons why I use the term atheist to define myself um, is because I think for one thing, many people have never heard of humanism or don't know what it is. And so there's kind of like, you know, I have to decide, do, am I, do I want to go through the process of explaining what that is or do I use a word that people are already familiar with, which I know sort of comes along with its own baggage, but then I can you know, sort of use that as an opportunity to challenge the, some of the conceptions that are associated with it. So I tend to use atheist a lot because it is something that is known um, and because there's an opportunity for a conversation around it because people come with preconceived notions about who atheists are and what atheism is. When I'm doing one of those speed faithing sessions, um, right away the first thing I'll do is I'll ask people in the room, you know, can you tell me what words come to mind when you hear the word atheist? And I'll, I'll say, you know, I know that I know that you know that I'm an atheist, but I want you to not worry about my feelings and just tell me honestly what are the words that come to mind. And right away the words I hear are, you know, mean-spirited, angry, aggressive, and hates God, uh, you know, um, nihilist, negative, blah, blah, blah. So there's all these, these associations. And, um, and when I ask people, then I'll say, okay, and tell me what comes to mind when you hear the word humanist, and it's like crickets. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's a part of why I choose that. But when I think when I think of myself in terms of what you know my ident what my sort of moral and ethical identity is, I do think of myself as a humanist, or specifically as a secular humanist. Um, in the same way that when I'm thinking of my own identity, I don't think of myself as not heterosexual. Right? I mean, it's sort of silly, but I don't think of myself as not heterosexual. I think of myself as queer and as gay. And, you know, when it comes to my gender identity, I, think of, I don't think of myself as not female. I think of myself as male. Um, and so I like the idea of framing something in the affirmational, of saying, of using language that um, describes uh, my, you know, my identity and my values. At the same time, I think that because atheists has such negative associations. It is a word ripe for reclaiming and for using um, in, and sort of tackling in the public discourse. So I use both, I guess, but I use atheist more when I'm writing um, or doing things sort of publicly because it's a word that people know. Um, okay, well, I guess I just want to say in closing, thank you all so much for coming out. It's awesome to hear from some of you. I'll be hanging around for a few minutes. I do have to get back to Boston tonight, but um, you know, if you had a question or a comment and you want to come up and talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, please feel free to do so. Otherwise, I'm online. I use social media, Facebook, Twitter, website, and all that stuff. So um, there's an email address for me. If you uh, look hard enough, you can find it online. It's publicly available. And I welcome you to reach out to me over Facebook or email or whatever else. And um, I want to leave the closing plug to just for the minute. But thank you. I just want to thank you all for coming out and uh, let you know that we've got another event coming up in November. It's going to be a, a panel discussion with uh, a few members of the faculty here at Hampshire. And we, um, 
for this event, we'll be talking about how different academics conceptualize religion from different academic positions. So we'll be hearing from Jim Wald on how he conceptualizes religion as a historian, Sue Darlington uh, on religion, how she conceptualizes it as, as an anthropologist, and Christoph Cox um, in terms of how he conceptualizes it as a philosopher. So I would encourage you to come out. I wish I could give you a specific date, but we're still ironing that out. But um, if you keep in touch with us, we will let you know very soon. <laughs> Thank you very much.